Well, I think we're just going to get started here. It's 9.30, and I know that everybody has lots of things they want to do throughout the day and lots of uh, uh, demos that are going on and other workshops and everything else. So we'll uh, let some people filter in. The, the keynote is probably, I'm guessing, is still going on upstairs, So uh, and he's a pretty compelling speaker, so a lot of those folks may uh, join us in a bit. So I'll just get the, get the ball rolling here. We're, we're calling this workshop, We're Tinkering With Your Dough, and uh, hopefully you're all here to tinker and to find out how these guys tinkered and, 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 and ways that uh, the things we've all learned the hard way and maybe some easy ways. Um, so we have uh, Brian Spangler from our Pizza Shoals in Portland, one of my all-time favorite pizzerias, and my other all-time favorite pizzeria and, and pizza yellow, John Arena, who all, many of you all know. John is a... John has been for many years, uh, you know, a real mainstay and anchor here, and in Las Vegas itself is really the guy, you know, and and has become a regular contributor to Pizza Quest, uh, my website, and uh, uh, he does guest columns, things for everything from you know business, how to how to do it right, things you need to know. Um, uh, his course, are you still teaching the course at university? I do it every other semester. Every other semester, so a, a course on on. Both, both the history of pizza and the business concept of development, pizza. how to how to develop a pizzeria and how to work together and put all the components together. So he's you know he basically I think the, if I had to sum it up, uh, John is always giving back, it's, and that's probably why he's so successful. Aside from having great pizza uh, and and running a great operation, he's always giving back, and I think that that is one of the reasons why he's so beloved in the community uh, because he's been a mentor to so many of the people out here. Who are already, you know, making their own marks now. And I feel Brian like you must be talking a, about somebody else. No, no, you're the guy. You're the guy. We love. We, we, it just when you every time you mention his name, ever just sort of like this gush of love comes out, as you know. And and Brian is well. He's only been to the expo a few times. I think way back when years ago when you first started out in 2004. And then and then last year came and did a panel, a really uh, fun panel with Nancy Silverton, and we did uh, something like this where we talked about their journeys. Uh, were any of you at that particular? You were there. You were there, so you know. Uh, and uh, Brian has. Both, well, the, the thing is, both of these guys have come to their to this moment in time in their own unique, individual way, as much of, as as many of you are on your own journeys. And so, what I want to do is just turn it over to each of them for about five to ten minutes to tell their story uh, and a little bit of their journey, their learning curve, so to speak. Uh, and then after that, I'll throw out a few questions to get the ball rolling. But we want to really leave time, a lot of time, for Q and A from you, so we'll run a microphone around and have you ask questions to, to them if, and whoever has something to, uh, to add to you know, or something interesting to tell you about that, we'll do our best to try to answer your questions and, um, and help you achieve what, it is, what you're here to achieve. Hopefully some of you are here to learn uh, how to maybe play or tinker with your own dose. Is that, would, is that a, a proper assessment? So you're, so you're thinking maybe there's still room for improvement or, or things you need to know that could take you to the next level. Um, how many of you here are not in the pizza business but are thinking about getting into it? That's quite a few, actually, so hopefully there'll be some, some things here. And then, of course, throughout the rest of the uh, expo, these guys are going to be everywhere and around, so at some point we'll tell them where you're going to be throughout the next couple of days if they want to follow you through. Uh, I know Brian's been spending a lot of time at where the King Arthur booth and a few other places. John is usually right. at about five different booths and doing. I'm booths. hoping somebody will tell me where I'm going to be. Yeah, we're going to. Have, we have to get. We have to have an app, an app guy following you around. Okay, so I'm going to turn. Up. Brian, why don't you go first and tell us a little bit about your journey? Well, I I came to pizza through the baking world. Um, I had a bakery uh, back in 2000 uh, called All Amount Baking Company, brick oven bakery, um, no mixer. Just uh, me and an oven and an axe. <laughs> um, and uh, I trained with DDA Rosada uh, for three weeks at the San Francisco Baking Institute um, and served on the board of directors with Peter. So we met in the bread world. So uh, essentially, uh, how I came into pizza after, you know, uh, with my bakery, I was kind of chained to my bakery. Uh, cause it was a one man show. It was me, an ax and an oven. Um, so I was there seven days a week, 
And the one day that I didn't make bread, I still had to be there because I was feeding my sourdough starter every eight hours. Um, so on that Sunday, my wife and I decided to have some sort of social interaction. <clears throat> we would uh, start making pizza. And I'd never made pizza before in my entire life. I was all about making uh, sourdough bread. Um, so we started telling people at the farmer's market and... and uh, and whatnot, come on over with a six pack and a, or a bottle of wine. We'll be out there, you know, experimenting. And uh, over the course of three years, we kept playing with the dough. We kept playing with how we we're going to top the pizzas and thinking about our ideals of what our memories of what, what, what our perfect ideal pizza was. Um, and it really came together to a point where now I was selling them on Sunday. <laughs> and uh, I used to make maybe six or eight pizzas for my friends, and they wanted more, and I started having to sell them. And then next thing I know, I'm making 60, 70 pizzas on my day off. <laughs> so um, I was getting kind of tired of being alone in a bakery just by myself, uh, uh, essentially six days, seven days a week. All well, that one day uh, on Sunday, I would have some people come over and, and finally have some social interaction. And uh, and it's really hard, bread world, especially that model, uh, what we were doing or I was doing, which was no mixer, wood-fired oven, making 200 loaves of bread a, a day by hand. Um, and it was getting taxing on me physically and mentally because of the uh, solitude. So a commercial, a rural commercial property came available. And I, I said, you know what? We've gotten so good at this pizza. And everybody's saying it's the best pizza they ever had. Maybe we should take a leap and open up a pizzeria. And so we did that. And... Um, this knucklehead comes through uh, a couple months after we opened up. And at, at first it was kind of slow, sometimes good, sometimes um, slow. But he comes through and uh, I didn't You were on your book tour for American Pie. And I had no idea. So I just got a call from the, the newspaper. We're going to come by with a, um, an author. We're going to, you know, we've heard great things. We want to sit down and, and have your pizza. Can we do that? And I'm like, of course. So he pulls up. They pull up in the car and out walks him. And we've been working together the, on the board of directors at the Red Baker's Guild of America. So that article comes out. A couple, and I didn't know it was his pizzeria when they brought me there. And a, yeah, a couple. Of weeks. <laughs> you had told me the last time I had seen him that he had this dream of opening a pizza, a pizza and barbecue place. Right. He said one day I'll do it, and then they then we walk in and I find out that he's done it. Here I am, and uh, that article comes out a couple of weeks later, and boom, uh, it 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 went from uh, zero to sixty in a heartbeat. So um, we had to got kicked out of the shoals which is a rural township, uh, has stipulations on rural commercial, uh, no parking really available or not. You know, we had limited parking and people were parking on the side of the highway, getting in accidents. And it was, it was quite chaotic. So we had to move into uh, Portland. So I'm going to explain why the name of Pizza Shoals comes up or is, came about is that uh, we were the Shoals public house out in the rural township of Shoals. But we couldn't hold on to that name moving into Portland. So I called up Peter, and I'm like, do I hold on to Shoals? And he's like, yeah, you have to hold on to that name um, because that's your you already have that identity. So my wife and I, Kim, we uh, somehow, how, how are we going to hold on to Shoals uh, in, in, in Portland? So I kept thinking and thinking and thinking. And then when I was in Santa Cruz, there was a place called a, a pizza my heart and i always loved the spelling of the uh, beats from uh connecticut a p i z z a and uh so a, a piece of shoals is a play on words we're a piece of shoals in portland i never knew that now you know <laughs> so i come from a a, a bread background and i trained with DDA and so everything my approach to the dough is completely from 
that expert baking background. So every time I I make my pizza dough and I'm constantly ev- changing and evolving with it, and it um, so that's how I came to be. Yeah, and that was about 15 years ago or so, approximately. And uh, and and I would say that that what Brian represent <coughs> uh, represents in this conversation today is the influence of the artisan bread movement into the pizza world because up until that point they were two separate constituencies and artisan bread was just coming up and pizza was pizza and everybody knew what they knew from the knowledge that was passed on but not the science and that was true with the bread world as well at that point is the the artisan bread movement grew here because we we brought over master bakers from Europe and other places to to give us the knowledge that they'd been having for years and years and and it took you know people in this country embraced it and went for it and started understanding the science of baking the chemistry everything else and then uh, little by little some of those people Brian Nancy Silverton as another who got into it through the bread side and then had that kind of influence on other pizza makers uh, I, I, I will see what John has to say about that but where that might have intersected with your development as a as a pizza maker and dough maker, but uh, these these sort of parallel tracks converged, I think, 10 to 15 years ago, and now we're seeing even the term artisan pizza movement as its own entity, and it's very much a parallel track, and much like the craft beer phenomenon has been a, uh, its own similar and yet different track. So Yeah, because that's liquid bread. <laughs> bread li- bread is, uh, beer is liquid bread. And yeah. Bread is solid beer, <clears throat> and pizza is the best of them all, you know, so. John? Okay. I'm John. Uh, I've been a pizza maker. F- I've been working, I started working my family pizzeria in 1965 when I was 11 years old. When I turned 13, the tradition in my family was when you turned 13, you got to be a pizza maker. So that I know exactly the day that I got, that I made my first pizza, the day after I turned 13, September 7th, 1967. I became a professional pizza maker. The first pizza that I made got sold. Got put in a box and went out the door. And my uncle turned to me and said, something that you made with your hands is going to become part of somebody's body. And you need to respect that. And that's sort of been my, my mantra or my guiding principle for the rest of my life. And he, you know, and he also added in that something that you made with your hands, somebody just paid money for. And that sealed the deal. So the only job I've ever had is working in a pizzeria, first for my family and then in my own pizzeria starting in 1980. My cousin Sam and I moved out here in 1980. We have been working together making pizzas for 52 years. So I can tell you with all honesty, my only superpower is survival. And we all know that it's a little, can be tough. But I'm going to ask you guys to do something for me. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up and hold up their hands. I can get a picture of this. Oh, you got to be. <laughs> oh, let me get this. That's, That's great. That's the next step. Thank you. Wait, stay up there. I got to get that. That's a great shot. I got to get that shot. <laughs> Holy cow. No gun yeah. All right. Oh, I got you to do it without a weapon. Thank you. That's my other superpower. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that part about getting money for what you did, but really you stuck behind. Yeah. Right. <laughs> These are our job security. This is what separates for us from the people that are pizza assemblers. Our hands. Our, what come, what's in our hearts coming through our hands and going into the food. This is why we can't be replaced by a machine. And to me, that sense of feel, that sense of touch, that sense of being connected to the food is what's really important and what really makes us different. What, if used correctly, can make us invulnerable to the competition of mass-produced pizza. I'm assuming that most of you are more, if you're in this room, you're probably more interested in being an artisanal pizza maker or uh, being a handcrafted pizza maker. You're probably not involved in a mass-produced chain type pizzeria. This is where it's at. Everything comes from here. No matter what formula you have, and I say formula because what we do now is clearly with, with influence of Brian and Peter and other bakers has become a formula, not a recipe. And then I mean a formula in a good sense, which means precise, scientific. But there still has to be heart, passion, a sense of feel, understanding what that only comes from practice and longevity and touching the dough. My dad, 
started out as a bread baker, in, uh, starting out when he was very young in, in New York City, in a, an Italian bread bakery in the ni- late 1930s. He's 90 years old. He comes to work every day, still works with me. So my whole life, I've been able to work with my dad side by side, which is an incredible blessing. And I was very lucky that my dad was not a guy who said, follow the tradition, do exactly what we did, don't change anything. He was exactly the opposite. He was get out there and learn as much as you can, study your craft, change everything. If it ain't broke, break it, and then try to, fix, try to make it better. And I know that's the opposite of what you usually hear from old time Italian guys, but that, that sparked me to go on the journey that led me to being at this table with Brian and Peter was that constant quest for making it better, making it improving, adding technique, adding, adding to your knowledge of, the, of how the ingredients work, how the equipment works. So we're going to have an interesting session today because I think we have, a, we have a slightly different path to where we ended up, but we all wanted to go to the same place, which is to make a better pizza and to express ourselves. You know, all of you probably have a, a favorite pizzeria that you grew up with, that you, grew, that, you, that you lived next to or around the corner from. And almost invariably, most of the great pizzerias of the old days were named after the person who was the lead pizza maker. And there's a reason for that. That was our Instagram. That was our social media. That was how we told the world who we were. We told the world who we were through our product. So we didn't have to boast about anything. We put our, na- we put our names on the door, and we said, this, eat my pizza. That will tell you who I am. And if we follow that and if we respect that, if we're always in a, in a position where we're understanding that what we put out on that plate is the real reveal of what we value, what's important to us, what, uh, what our life experiences have been, that becomes, that becomes an honest pizza that people will enjoy. That expression of self, I think, is what we're all, we're all striving for as independent pizza operators. Thank you. Word. Uh, good. Are you going to say something? No, oh, okay. I was just agreeing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a couple of, uh, quick questions. There you go. Hands. <laughs> Great. Thank you. We're going to have an all new thing now as we walk here. Right? Well, the, <laughs> it's going to be our, our shibboleth as we go. And we go. This, is, this identity. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, isn't there a, now there's a term floating around here? Uh, these uh, hands. These hands. These right. hands, which, which is, was sort of the brainchild of Rob Dinopoli. Rob Dinopoli of Dinopoli. Right, right. And it's turning into kind of a little movement of its own. Uh, let me ask both of you uh, this question. And that is, when I, when I first entered, uh, in your case, uh, Alpisa Shoals, the, the original Alpisa Shoals in Shoal Valley there, um, the dough was different than when I came back a couple of years later. The crust tasted different to me. I remember that day you asked me, because you had just opened and asked me what I thought, and I said I, I asked you a couple of questions. I asked if you were using pre-ferments and how you arrived at your formula for your dough, and you said you were still tweaking it. Can right. you talk a little bit about the tweaking process to, that led you then later to your later iterations into your current dough? Wow. that's uh, <laughs> um, Originally, uh, it was pretty much... Uh, you, again, it was always been poolish um, because I didn't want to do any, I didn't have any refrigerators to um, hold dough. So it had to be uh, complete ambient fermentation. I was um, basically tweaking with how much pre ferment to add. So, like, essentially, your poolish, if those who don't know, is uh, basically 100% hydrated pre ferment. And depending on how long you want that pre ferment, to go to develop um, the acids and uh, flavor. Uh, so I was doing this, this pre-ferment to get it in line for a bulk mix the next morning. I was doing about a 12, 14 hour pre-ferment and uh, doing the bulk shaping, letting it uh, proof so it would be ready by five o'clock for service. So it was always like, how much pre-ferment am I going to add to get to that point? The flavor profile changes that happen with, you know, doing maybe pre-fermenting 25% of the flour, 30% of the flour. But that also changes the speed and rate of uh, the fermentation of the final dough. So back then I was, uh, it was kind of like almost like a baguette formula, to be honest with you. And then adjusting with the hydration rates uh, of that dough and back then I was I was a little I was pretty high on the hydration I think it was running around 72 percent um 
And not all flowers, you know, and of course, back then I was using Harvest Kings and playing with other kinds of flowers. So every time you, you play with a different cocktail, you know, mix of flowers or a different um, producer, which is getting their weed from a different uh, farm and all these other changes, you have to move. Like, you know, I was working with Chris Bianco with you about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And he said something very, you know, like I, I always refer to this as like when the floor moves, move with it. So when you play with a different flower, um, not all flowers want the same thing. Some don't want as much water as, you know, uh, the, another flower will. So, yeah, it's a uh, and right now I'm experimenting with different cocktails of different flowers in the pre ferment than in the final dough. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's always evolving and it's, it's still still poolish based pool for the and the poolish is like this wet sponge pre ferment it is any and yeast any any uh, any natural leavening now in your dough no I don't want that flavor profile um, I'm a big fan of 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 natural leavening that's my whole background but it's not the flavor profile I want in pizza I don't want the acetic acid I'm looking for lactic acid and there are a lot of people now it's, I'm, natural leavened dough is a hot thing but a lot of people who are going i'm going to go natural 11 don't even know what they're doing Mm -hmm. they don't realize that you can promote different flavors with different techniques every action has a reaction um so i don't want that acetic and most people who are doing natural 11 who don't know what they're doing a lot of that stuff is really really sour um and that's not what i want i want nice creamy flavor so i'm trying to get that lactic acid so now just to complete that's that cycle so uh what kind of flour are you currently using and and hydration levels currently um, okay, so we're going to try to squeeze all the secrets out of these guys <laughs> today so uh well with each lot of flour um that things change so even the same we we use a uh, central milling flour well, what's great about central milling is that i can get the uh certificate of analysis for every lot so when I get that, I can actually see uh, what the hydration rate is going to be or potentially be for that flower. Um, right now, we're running about 67 percent. And uh, that's because what that flower wants. And um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of the question? Um, if, well, I think it was if you were using. Oh, what kind of flower? Or, FN, yeah, I've always been a big fan of uh, winter wheat um, instead of spring wheat. Spring wheat is a uh, higher protein content, um, but it has lower quality protein, whereas winter wheat has uh, less protein content, but it's a higher quality of protein. Mm. And uh, for long fermentations, you want higher quality of, of protein. So generally, I, all winter wheat, that's uh, relatively about 11 and to 12%. Do you, uh, it's, is it always unbleached flour? You- oh, always. So I know that there's still some, uh, you know, discussion uh, because you're, you're, for those who don't know, a pizza shows uh, pizza is kind of an East Coast homage. It's your take on uh, uh, maybe New Haven, New New York style pizza. It's not quote Neapolitan wood fired pizza baked in a in a uh, like a baker's pride oven or something like that or a deck oven. We is a pizza master now, but when we started out in Shoals doing the experiments um, on Sundays. We, our kind of ideals that were coming through were these old coal oven, brick oven pizzerias that were, you know, like neo, neo, neo Neapolitan. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's was kind of our gold standard ideal. And um, but yeah. I, I use an electric deck oven now. And um, thank goodness, because um, <laughs> yeah. wood is a pain, <laughs> total pain. Um if I recall, you know, you had you had to kind of jerry rig your your original oven to get to the higher temperatures that you wanted to achieve, right? It wasn't set to give you that. Oh no, it 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 went wherever I wanted it to go, but it uh, you can get away from you pretty fast. Um, electric, uh, that stuff, because you have the the elements underneath and elements above, um, and you have the infinite switches. You know, basically, you can set the dial for both above you know the 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 dome as well as underneath the hearth um but if you're not careful while you're tweaking that during production it can get away from you yeah yeah so it's a, so that's a, you know the style with so many different styles as you all know and you're all 
probably you're making different styles. So, so that's sort of how you got to the, the current point. Are you still making, do you find yourself still tweaking from time to time? Always. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, this last year we were having some problems with the police getting away from us. And I'm, I'm pretty convinced that because um, we've been in the same location now for 14 years that the entire environment is basically inoculated already. So because the police, we were lowering the water temperature, reducing the yeast, and it still kept getting away from us. So we um, started, I'm not technically, a, I guess, technically a police anymore because we reduced it to an 80% hydration pre-ferment. And then we started using a flour that is also central milling, but it has uh, ascorbic acid in it. And ascorbic acid reinforces gluten. So it gives you strength for longevity of, of uh, fermentation. So by making that move, I think we have like some of the best dough of pizza dough I've ever made. Well, and I think what uh, you know, we, I'm not um, promoting any particular brands here, but everyone has the brands no. that they like. But because uh, Central Milling does have a boot there, if any of you want to follow up on any of the things he's saying, I advise you to go there on the, during the show and talk to them. And because I th and you should have that relationship with whatever mill, milling company you're using is to be able to get the specs and to talk to them about these issues. So where does ascorbic acid fit in? Uh, you know, most, of, most brands do have it now in it, but some don't. And in some cases you want it, some cases you don't. Correct. So things like that, th this is where each of us has to kind of come up now in our own knowledge base uh, and the people Aside from the people at this table, the people who can help you get there are the ones who you're, you're getting your flour from. And, you, and so you may have a different brand that you love, and, and you should. Uh, so, I mean, John, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the, the flour that you like to use, but also the things you've learned in, in I use, uh, the evolution. I use General Mills Supreme, which is about 13.5% protein, has ascorbic acid in it. I do a, you know, people talk about long fermentation, but let's define what long fermentation is. For, for the Italians, long fermentation is 24 hours. For me, long fermentation is minimum 72 hours. Mm -hmm. And for my Sicilian pizza, I do five days. So I'm extending it out, five days, five day ferment. But in that five days, I'm getting the flavor development that I want. I'm getting relaxation of the protein strands, and I'm getting development of uh, amino acids. And, and I agree with you, Brian. I, I'm not a big fan of really sour pizza. I think what we're really trying to do, and Peter writes so eloquently about this in his books, we're trying to coax the optimum flavor out of the wheat. I want my pizza to taste like wheat that's been given a chance to show its stuff. Mm -hmm. right. You know, I'm not an equipment freak. I've worked with the, with the Pizza Master ovens. I, I use Marsal's or, or really old Baker's Prides in my pizzerias, but I can tell you that this is not an, an advertisement for Pizza Master, but the best pizzas I've ever made were at the pizza, the pizza festival in New York using a Pizza Master. Incredible oven. But really, the reality is for me, what goes into the oven dictates what comes out of the oven more than the oven itself. Yeah, you have to have the right equipment, but I'm not an equipment freak. No. I'm more about what am I putting in there. It's like, uh, you know, Chris Bianco in his, in his own colorful way, excuse I'm quoting Chris, so this is not me talking. You put shit in the oven, you get shit out of the oven. <laughs> <clears throat> that doesn't sound like Chris at all. <laughs> uh, uh, along those lines, I, when I first was talking to Brian that very first uh, time when you opened uh, a show's, is uh, I asked him if he was using a wood-fired oven then because this was like just the beginning of people getting into wood-fired pizzas. And he, and he made, uh, I think, a great quote. I don't know if you remember what it was, but it had to do with BTUs. Oh, well, BTUs are BTUs. Uh, yeah. the, 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 um, the experience of building, I lived with Alan Scott for uh, a month while I was uh, apprenticing with Tim Decker, good what friend of mine. Um, and I got to build ovens with Alan. And so when I didn't have much money, so I, like, when I said I was just out there with my hands and uh, an ax, I had very little money to start the bakery, so I built the oven by hand. And uh, that experience of not being able to turn on a dial and you know, get the, the oven turned on and having a mixer, with having nothing and having relying solely on these hands, um, 
when it comes to uh, problem solving, I, I can MacGyver anything in, in baking. So it's not, I'm not an equip, equipment freak either. Now I have, you know, in a spiral mixer, uh, I got, you know, the best of the best. I love it. It's great. Um, but that experience of not being reliant upon the equipment, I'm, a, I'm not afraid of anything. Uh, and my memory of the quote was, uh, he said, uh, it's not the source of the heat, it's the quality of the BTUs. Right. And I never forgot that because I, the, the quality of the heat, I think, was a big part. But like John says, it's, it starts before the, the oven. It all starts right. with what goes right. in. You know, for example, what kind of oven does Taconellas use? It's, it's wood fired. It's oil fired. It's oil, is it? Is it's, it? An, it's an oil fired uh, brick oil, oven. Oil, that, oil that, fired deep, oven. Deep. They, use, they use oil as their source of heat. Yeah. Oh. What type of oven does, Pe does Frank, does Pepe's use? Coal. Coal. What type of oven does Defaras use? I'm going to guess it's gas. It's a gas oven. Yeah. What type of oven does Bonchi use? Electric. Electric, yeah. So we've got these amazing pizza makers all over the world using different types of equipment. As Brian said, it's about the BTUs. Pizza doesn't know what the source of the heat was. But it does respond to the power. Right. So, so back to the, 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 the dough that you were making 15, 20 years ago in, at Metro is, is, is different now or the not? Worst thing, the worst thing that happens to me, and it happens almost every day, is a custom. I have, I've been in Las Vegas for 38 years, so I'm on some, some, in some cases four generations from the same family eating in my pizzeria. And people will come up to me sometimes and say, your pizza is so amazing, it's exactly the same as it was in 1980. <laughs> And I want to kill myself because we're like, <laughs> you know, because since 1980, I've been struggling and trying to trying to learn more about my craft, yeah. traveling all around the world, practicing, experimenting. And then they tell me it's exactly the same. And I feel like a tremendous failure. But really, it's a compliment because, <clears throat> because if you stay the same, you're really sliding backwards. And what they're really I think what they're really saying is, is, is it lived up to my memory of right. how it was the first time that you blew my mind, right. and now it's still blowing my mind. Right, and that's right. the challenge for us, is we're not competing against the pizzeria down the street, we're, we're, and it's, it's not, not even just about what's on the plate, it's what's in the person's heart, what their emotional response is to what we do. So if we stay the same, it loses its effectiveness. You gotta keep making it better all the time just to stay in the same place in their hearts because their perception is going to be different yeah. every time they come in. Every time a customer walks into your pizzeria, they're a different person than they were the last time they were there. You don't know what their life experiences have been, what, what's gone on in their lives when they were driving to your place. Yeah. So, you, so you have to, in order to ha have that primary place in their hearts, you have to keep making it better. So if what are some of the things that you've done uh, as you've continued to tweak it to betterness? Change the fermentation time to extend it. You know, in the old days, pizzeria, and I grew up in a New York pizzeria, we didn't have a lot of space. So you couldn't, you didn't really have room to do a five-day fermentation. My biggest store now is 10,000 square feet. So I've got room to store five days worth of dough. Mm. Not everybody has that luxury. So, you know, as, as Peter always says, we're playing, we're really, everything that we do in the bread world and in the pizza world is about manipulation of time. So you either have to have the room to really to do to take the time, or you have to know how to make how to how to duplicate that that result in less time, using a poolish, using a biga, in some cases using a starter. So it's all about you know how does the time affect your product. So we've played with that a lot. We played a little bit with the hydration. We're not a super high high hydration. You know, we're not doing what Noel does, where it's like 110 <laughs> percent hydration. Where, you know, it's like his dough originally looks like a batter until he beats it up. I think there's a point of diminishing returns with that. Mm -hmm. I don't think you have to go to 100 percent or even 90 percent. I think 70 to 80 is probably the, the to me the max. I do about 65 and then two percent oil. How many different types of pizzas do you make? You, you Metro is a tribute to different metropolitan areas. It is, areas. but the, the goal for me is to get the same to get a different result. Out of the same dough. So it's, it's one dough, but applied. One dough, course, but, course. but okay. maybe the, the hand technique is different, or maybe the fermentation is extended, or there is some other manipulation factor that gives me a different result that can get to the same place. And that's all about knowing how your hands, how time, how temperature affects the finished process. But my formulas are almost exactly the same for each type of pizza. Although you would never know that when you, when you taste them. You, you were in my place over the weekend. Um, 
my New York style thin crust pizza has a completely different texture and flavor than my Sicilian pizza, but it's essentially the same dough. Same dough. Mm. Now I'm going to um, uh, open this floor up, so if, if you have <coughs> questions, please come to that mic so that we can get it on tape and, uh, and ask, ask your question, but we'll keep the conversation going until a few of you get up and, and, and uh, bring some of your, your concerns and questions. Uh, I want to talk a little, we, we mentioned uh, that neither of these guys are really big on using the wild yeast or natural starters, but yet this is a growing category that's taking place you know, across board. Um, there's a lot of knowledge required to be able to, it's a, a much more, uh, it's like flying without a net a little bit. You've got to understand these controls of time and temperature. Uh, but it's equally true with yeast, with commercial yeast, is it's all about this, the sensitivity that dough is, and yeast is responsive to temperature, and then the dough itself is responsive to all of the, the uh, uh, biological activity that's going on in the dough that is evoking flavor from the grain. Yeah, the flavor profiles change on hydration rates and temperatures, and a lot of people don't know that. Acetic acid is promoted from lower hydration rates and colder fermentation, and lactic acid is promoted by higher hydration rates and ambient and warmer temperatures. Interesting. And of course, some pizzerias uh, kind of pride themselves on the fact that the pizza is different every day. It's not their thing to have it be exactly the same every day. It's part of the marketing, and some people, you know, and some are where it's going to be equal to you know what you had yesterday. Right. Okay, we got some questions. Let's let's see uh, let's see where we go. Yeah. First. Peter, I'd like to thank you for letting me learn about breads, because you're just like the guru of bread. So <laughs> thank you for for that. Appreciate um, it. But I do have a question regarding water. I'm from Minnesota, and we get our water from Mississippi, right? In the summer, the water consistency is different than in the winter. It's, it's a different profile, and it actually changes my dough. Uh, do you have any recommendations, or do you rely on distilled water or just use tap water like everybody else does primarily? I just use tap water. Uh, in Oregon, we uh, have really amazing water. Um, but it sounds like, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure why your water would be changing, but mineral content is the most important element of water that you should know about is um, minerals are food. So when you have high, higher mineral content, you're going to have more activity in your, in your dough. And when you have less mineral content, you're going to have less activity. Yeah, well, the reason it's, it's different is in the summertime, there's a lot of algaes and, and live things in the water. Uh, you can actually see it. it I, when I fill my pool in the spring, it's green, right? Um, and then in the winter, it's, it's ultra clear. It's just it's amazing the difference, even though the city filters it. It's a completely different product because it comes out of the tap. Right. Because it's coming directly from the Mississippi River. Well, let's stay, let's stay with this, uh, John. Okay, so, this? You, know, you definitely, water is, water is an ingredient. So you change the variable, you get a different result. That's basically the science. So if I were in your situation, you know, I'm in Las Vegas, which is not exactly known for its water either. Um, and you, you have high chlorine content here. We do. Uh, you know, but we also have some minerality. You don't want to, You never want to use distilled water because, as Brian said, you need to, you need to have the minerality to f feed the product. Um, I would use a, either use bottled water or, use, or get a really good filtration system, an RO system, and uh, charcoal filters. Yeah, with reverse. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. I don't, with a, if you got a reverse osmosis system for your, you could actually dial in whatever quality of water you want. Although now, of course, there's even, I think, some, some companies here uh, promoting some systems, like the New York Water System folks, who have systems that they can dial their system to give you the, the uh, pH and mineral content you want if you're finding problematic. Otherwise, I think uh, there are some just general filtration systems to get rid of the chlorine effect and without taking out a lot of the good minerals that you want. So, but it is. Water is really, really important, and yet at the same time, uh, again, a lot of people feel like, oh, I've got, the, I've got the same water they use in Naples or in New York, therefore, it's kind of like saying, therefore, I have, and I have the right oven, therefore, I'm going to have great pizza. It's still, it's only one piece of the puzzle. Right. You also have to ask yourself if your goal is to make the pizza of Naples or the pizza of New York or the pizza of, that's of Minneapolis your pizza. or Minnesota. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, yeah. yeah, I make my pizza. I don't 
Right. I don't want to be held to any standard. (laughs) Right. The standards are are subjective anyway. Absolutely. You know, in reality, make the pizza that resonates with you. And yeah, it's your expression. Decide what you want your pizza to be and then work to that. And ultimately, uh, you know, Chris Bianco talks about this all the time. He's not he's not replicating the pizza of a particular area. He's making his pizza. You know, and, and as I said earlier, that's why those old, the old pizzerias had the had the pizza maker's name on the door, because the pizza they were not saying I make New York. You know, nobody in New York was saying I make New York style pizza. They were making their pizza. Totono's was making Totono's pizza, an expression of who that person was. And that's really the path to greatness: is decide what your pizza is going to be. Transcend. Now, I, my Neapolitan friends are going to hate this, but trans, transcend the style and make it an ex- a personal expression. And I think you'll yeah. come up with something that's And now the knowledge is available to how, once you figure out what you want to make, then you can find out the, 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 the tricks and the science behind how to dial that in, uh, which is the new, this is really new. The Pizza Expo itself has changed over the year to have much more focus and emphasis on this, getting the knowledge to you on how to make the decisions once you've zeroed in on the style you want. Uh, Scott, do you want to jump in? Yeah. yeah um, it's, I guess, going along with what you just said, Peter, about how Pizza Expo and just pizza makers are getting more into bread baking. With all the variables that everybody's kind of getting into, whether it's hydration, like John just mentioned, super, super high hydration like Noel makes, or fermentation time, is there an element of bread baking or pizza dough making that people are focusing on that you think is maybe people are overemphasizing or thinking too much about that's a waste of time? <laughs> I just, I, I hear people right now, I'm kind of not hip with this whole naturally leavened craze. Um, I think if people are focused too much on that. They should be focused more on the science of every, you know, of, of bread itself because every action has a reaction. Um, and uh, I think people are, are focusing too much on buzzwords and um lack of concern about how the process unfolds, you know, using any particular method. Um, and hydration, I think, is also um, being over. It's, it, I don't, not every flower wants, wants to uh, be super hydrated. And I think it's almost like, it's maybe a cool challenge for yourself, because I love, you know, seeing what I can do with, you know, pushing the limits, but it doesn't mean it's good. Uh, sometimes it's it's not as good, <laughs> so it's kind of kinda like you have to uh, learn what the flower wants and and work with that. But that that comes from experience and knowledge. And so I'd like you know again this old naturally leaven thing. It's like great, cool. So if how are you going to make your naturally leavened bread consistent? And what is the flavor profile you want? Because when you get into sourdough, that's that's you can craft your sourdough for any particular flavor, but you have to understand all the actions and reactions to achieve that flavor. And if you don't understand that, how are you going to have a consistent product? So, the, so you, so I think what I heard in the question is, can you overthink oh. the, the making of your 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 dough and maybe obsess too much on on technique or or uh, ideology or whatever uh, to where you're you're to the detriment of your final product. And, and of course, the answer is always yes. You can overthink it. I've heard people who can uh, who can speak for hours on all the science behind their pizza, and then at some point you want to say, okay, okay, shut up and make me a pizza, and let me see if it lives up to the hype in your mind. Right. And and so, so which and it's and I think it's so important to have this knowledge, and then eventually you've got to integrate that because in the bottom line, it's still the pizza that speaks, the product speaks, right? I'm going to turn this question on you, Scott. What's the one thing that you and I discuss the most, the, the buzzword that people, that people use when they're talking about their pizza dough that has probably very little science to back it up? Digestibility. Digestibility. We're always hearing from, from pizza makers, I use natural fermentation because it's more digestible. Prove it. Show me the science. You know? Well, that's a good challenge to, the, to, to that claim and... and uh, interesting enough, I'll throw a little plug out here. We're going to be uh, hosting a uh, international bread symposium 
at Johnson & Wales, June 12th to 14th. Very limited seating. It's our third year. And one of the three tracks that we will be following is, is uh, Tom, when some of you heard Tom Gumpel yesterday speak on the topic of good bread is good for you, is, um, is attempting to get to the bottom of what does make well, or what can make bread products more digestible and, and promote more better gut health because we know that there are challenges and bread has rightly been challenged to, to have you know, some digestibility issues for some people. So the science has been lagging behind the claims. The, a lot of it is intuitive you know, assumptions. So we, we want to start to put some teeth into those claims. So we're gonna have a few experts there uh, following that track. We're gonna have another track that's all about sourdough because sourdough, there are a lot of positives that, have, that are associated with sourdough both for flavor and digestibility. There's gonna be a track that's gonna dig deep into the microbiology of that. And then there will be another track that's gonna be about local grains, working with local and, and ancient and heirloom grains. So I'm saying that just in case, you, if you have any interest, we haven't sent out the press release on it yet. Tickets aren't even gonna go on sale for about three more weeks. But just go International Symposium on Bread. You can see some of the videos from our previous years on YouTube, just put in the search engine that. But if you are interested in getting deeper into any of these tracks, then look for, uh, send me an email at, uh, just send it to me at peter at pizzaquest.com and I'll get your name on, the, on the, the database so you can get the mailings when they go out in three weeks. Peter, uh, I have a question for you. Yeah. If you buy a sourdough from, a sour from Alaska and you take it to Ohio, in a few days, is it still a sour from, from Alaska? That is the, that's the exact same question I asked Ed Wood, the, the guy who wrote the book on sourdoughs from antiquity years ago. He's a, he's a, uh, a doctor of microbiology himself. And he claims that he, he can protect it, but no. I found that depending on where you live, if, as you start to feed the starters with the flour that you're working with in the uh, environment in which you live, it won't happen overnight, but within about a month or so, you're going to find that it's going to become like anyone else's starter from that region using that flour. So those are like the little things that you need to be thinking about and knowing about. Uh, and But then again, then it makes it a, Anthony Mangier is making a New York uh, sourdough crust, right? Because he's back in New York. It's very different than the sourdough crust that he made when he was in San Francisco doing the same, the same pizzas because the starter, uh, adapts to the environment there. Like different bacteria. Yeah. Exactly. And then there are other the people that are process. using right. uh, sourdough uh, starter cultures and making every batch from scratch, not trying to keep it alive from batch to batch, but, st but starting a whole new starter each time to try to maintain some uniformity using the cultures that were brought in by the companies that are, uh, and, and, and this is, I think, a valid approach also. There's no invalid thing. It's really, in the end, is uh, I always say the only rule that, that counts is the flavor rule. And the flavor rule is flavor rules. <laughs> and, and so when people, and I get letters all the time from people saying, can I do this, can I tweet, do that? And I always say, does it work? And they go, well, it tastes pretty good. And are you happy with it? Yeah. Flavor rule trumps the pizza police rule or whatever, you know. So. Yeah. I shouldn't use that word, huh? Trumps. Uh, <laughs> has, that has a whole new meaning too. That's an evolving word. Too. Okay, go ahead. Uh, oh, when it, uh, jump in. Right, yeah, so uh, my question is for the guys that are trying to um, come up closer. with a good Neapolitan recipe. Can you get a little closer to oh, I'm my... I'm sorry. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, for the guys that are trying to achieve like a good dough for Neapolitan style or a New York style pizza, um, they, they are incorporating a lot of the biga and the, uh, the poolish as well. And so, um, and those, are, those times are not, the fermentation times are not as long and so, do you find yourself using malts or other sugars or honey or anything like that to kind of speed up the process or kind of level out the uh, flavor profiles in the dough when, you, when you're in your mix? I would increase the amount of pre-ferment in the final dough. That would speed everything up because you're pre-fermenting more of the flour in your final dough. So, if you were wanting to speed it up, if you're not getting your results at pre-fermenting 25% of it, pre-ferment 40% of it, pre-ferment 50% of it. That stuff will boogie. Now, what, what about the uh, use of other ingredients? Do you, I, do you use any kind of sugars or, or honeys or anything in your dough? 
Typically, I use flour, water, salt, olive oil, and yeast. And no sweeteners. That's it. That's my that's my secret same recipe. With you? Um, <laughs> which is the same, probably the same secret recipe that everybody else has. I told you I don't, to get those <clears throat> secrets. The secret, and you all have the same right, secret. Yeah. Right. I don't put sugar in the dough. I don't put malt in the dough. It, my uh, my flour has some malted barley in it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's already malt there. Yeah. You know, if, the only time I would use malt is if I was stuck using the wrong flour for the job. For example, if I'm trying to make a, if I'm trying to use a double zero flour in an oven that doesn't get hot enough to brown that dough, I don't know what bizarre circumstance that, that would, would cause that to happen. But if it does happen, I would might put malt in the dough, biostatic malt. A lot of people put sugar in their doughs as a what I call a CYA, cover your ass. Um, it'll brown whether it's uh, under-fermented or over-fermented. Yeah, sugar belongs in cakes. <laughs> Right. Okay, what about uh, the question just came about salt. Uh, are you guys pretty, uh, what range of salt do you like to have in your, in your doughs? I just learned, uh, I used to be like the 2% rule um, until I uh, hung out with this uh, master German baker uh, last year, and he's like, oh, no. And it, I, it actually is, it works. It's uh, take 1.4% of the flour and the water add the flour and the water together times by 1.4 percent and i was like why he's like well when you go to 80 percent hydration you're diluting right and if you have a 40 percent hydration you know the you need more you need more or less salt to go along with the water because if you have a high content of water it's not going to react the same way as if you know if the, does that make sense like 80 percent hydration are you, yeah, are still, you doing that now with your dough yeah Right. Interesting. I, and I, I do that too. If I'm doing a dough that's 64% hydration, I'm going to be at 2.5% salt. Right. If I'm doing 70%, I might be at 2.75. Interesting. If I'm doing 80%, I'd be at 3. So even using the, uh, the, the, the flour percentage, it's still, you're still above 2%. Yes. So you're, you're above yes. that sort of av- that average. If number. you can remember when we judged the, caput- the first Caputo cup together, the comment that we had about, about many of the doughs was that. They were under under salt. Yeah, the dose tasted under salted. Right. Yeah. So you're actually so he's talking about Neapolitan. Were those Neapolitan doughs? Or, yeah. or were those uh, the Neapolitans are typically at around two point five. Two point five percent. So it's higher than the the average bread is about two percent, one point eight to two percent salt to flour. Uh, so uh, with with certain pizzas, we're going higher. Two point. I've heard of pizzas that go up to three percent. Anybody working at three percent salt to flour? Uh, but I've heard of a lot of people successfully doing that. Um, so it really depends. But then but this is new for me. I'm not, I've never heard the 1.4 rule, so I've got to write that down it makes, now. It makes total sense. It's a new secret trick for it's me a now. Combination I'm going to of, of water and yeah, flour. so it's not just a combination of flour. It's not, not just relative to flour. Exactly. It's how diluted you did. You Anybody using that method now currently? So now, well, now we will ask. Here. The okay, question. show's we over. Will Thank be you. Next year, right? Next. Well, it's really. I just started the news ago, trend. Two years ago, if I had asked how many are using pre-ferments and poolish, just very few hands would go up. Everybody knows what a, almost everyone knows now what a poolish or a biga is right. because again the knowledge base has, has risen. So I'm gonna I'm gonna report back next year on my success with that using that formula. We'll see. But, I have a uh, question for the audience. Okay. How many of you are using Baker's percentages? Great. Way more, yeah, way more, way more hands have gone up right. this year than would have gone up two right. years ago. I, I asked that question in, the, in New York several years ago, and nobody's hands went up. I said, how many of you are weighing your ingredients? Nobody's hands went up. I said, how many of you have an Uncle Vinny that wrote a, drew a line on a bucket, and that's where you, that's where you fill your, your water up to? <laughs> yeah. All of them went up. <laughs> well, here again, you know, it if you want down to have what? These hands. People get hung up, get hung up on atmosphere, where your water came from, whether or not it's raining, which direction the wind's blowing. So step one, weigh your ingredients accurately and understand Baker's percentages. Learn the metri- metric system and join the rest of the world, guys. What'd you say? Welcome to New York. <laughs> no, he's no longer. Persona non grata. No. <laughs> yeah, you go to uh, uh, Heretic. The old, old pizza race, there's a picture in with a line through it like that. <laughs> Question. Good morning. Um, thank you first for this opportunity. It's um, so wonderful to have the opportunity. You've all been so humble and welcoming, and especially for those of us who aren't even in the business yet. So I have a question about if you're the um, kind of weekend warriors practicing at home and learning, and there are so many variables that can you can really start to have fun with and get out of control and maybe not learn as well. 
where do you suggest for a 101? Do you start with trying different flowers and play with and keep the other variables constant, or would you pick one flower and play with the other variables, or any other different recommendation than that? Good question. Suggestion. My suggestion is always basic, basic scientific principle: never change more than one variable at a time, because you don't know what you don't know what what caused the result that you got. So pick something, pick a flower that you want to work with, for example, and then work with changing hydration level, changing salt level, changing your mixing method. But don't do them all at once. You know, maybe you, maybe you make your first batch just doing direct mix method, and then you experiment with multi-stage mixing, with doing, uh, you know, with making a biga, making a poolish, tweaking it that way, but only one thing at a time. And record all your results. I, I, I talk, and you know, this is a, something I talk to a lot of um, other pizza operators. We have a board on our wall where we record the air temperature, the water temperature, the flower temperature, the mixing time, the poolish temperature, and then we record the results of everything and then have comments for how was the dough. So we're the next day we can come in and look at how it's been progressing uh, with the final dough temperature, all the other variables. Um, so that everybody's on track with how to keep it all consistent. It was, oh, we didn't came, we only came to uh, 72 uh, degrees final dough temp and it was behind. Okay, so we need, you know, we need to increase the water temperature. So it keeps people on track for that consistency. That's, I think that's really important. An uh, accurate scale and a thermometer are your best friends. Accurate scale and thermometer, good. I'll add one more uh, piece to that. Um, for, those, uh, for those who want to come, kind of increase your your knowledge of the science of baking and all, the uh, Bread Bakers Guild of America booth is down in the 400 row. It's almost at the very end of the hall. Uh, they have some. If they have any left, they had some uh, some of their quarterly bulletins. If you want to really come up to speed join the Bread Bakers Guild of America. It is the repository in, in the Western Hemisphere for the best knowledge of uh, bread science, baking science. Uh, it's worth every penny, and it also allows you to attend some of their special workshops that happen throughout the year. So that's part one. Part two is, if you do have a flower that you like, or a flower company that you like, uh, they very often, for instance, if you were to go to, uh, whether it's a Central Milling or General Mills, Bill Weekly is here from General Mills, those guys can help you develop a, a formula or fine-tune your formulas and work with you because they all have technical experts. So once they know that you like what the flour does, they can help you to perfect your dough. And some people like to use a couple different companies and, and then blend them yourself. So these are all these are within the realm of possibility. But use those resources out there to help you dial in on where you want to go and, and then you can you know, always contact them again if you have questions about you know, how to tweak it. Okay, let's keep, get a couple more in before we run out of time. So, this is a question for Brian. Yeah. Uh, you were talking a little bit. Can you Brian, speak up a little bit more? Yeah, Brian, you were talking a little bit about um, protein quality versus content. And I was just wondering if protein you could quality. expand on that a little bit and maybe talk about the attributes of what a poorer protein quality um, would give you in your dough. Oh, it, it's not about what it does in the final. Well, that's not about what it has in the final product. It's about, I do ambient fermentation. I don't do cold fermentation. So when you do long extended ambient fermentation, the protein quality gives you that, um, what's the best way to say, uh, fermentation tolerance. Um, a lower quality protein might give up because you know gluten can only trap gas to a certain point. It's like gluten's like a, a a piece of gum. You take raw or flour and protein and gluten are all like gum. So this is a great analogy that you can't do anything with dough if it hasn't been developed. It doesn't really trap gas. Just like a piece of gum doesn't do it. You can't blow a bubble if it hasn't been developed. But the difference is between gum and gluten is that gluten, when you blow a bubble on, with gum, when it finally collapses, you can go ahead and blow another bubble. With gluten, you can't. Once it, once it reaches its final point of being able to uh, contain that gas, it'll, it'll collapse and then you've got nothing. Um, so with a higher quality 
gluten or protein content you, when you're going for those longer fermentations it gives you that tolerance of of pushing that point and it not collapsing right and that's one of the things that uh on the east coast when they use bromated flour they're using they're using that to uh take advantage extend that time right and make those things happen and in a more controlled way right and that's why there's sometimes like with a lot, a lot of spring wheat uh flowers are including ascorbic acid for that right. very reason to replace the bromate right. not all protein is created equal nope right. so you have to ask questions ask questions of the miller because just just saying 14 percent protein or 15 percent protein is not telling you the whole story just like if you if somebody says double zero flour most people don't even really know what that is. They just know that they've been told on, on Food Channel or Cooking Network that they're supposed to use double zero flour. When you ask them what it is, they have no, no real idea. Even some of the pizza makers that have been using it for years don't know what double zero really means. That's good. Did I answer your question or help? To, <laughs> there you are. Okay, good. Next one. We've got a couple more minutes. I think we've got about five more minutes. It might take me five minutes to get this question out of my mouth. Oh, we have to 11? Yeah. We have to 11? Oh, yeah. we can go longer. An hour and a half. Okay, we can go right. longer if you can go longer. Oh, yeah, we got plenty we'll, of time. We stay another 20 minutes. So it sounds like you're all kind of on the same level and agreed on using the Vigo or Pulish over wild or natural fermentation. Um, I wanted to ask you from a perspective of a high production business that consistency is just as important as the craft. We want to be putting out the same product over and over. And um, I wanted to ask you if there's a certain production level where it doesn't even make sense to go that direction of pool or bigger and using just like a dry active yeast is actually better. Say, for instance, uh, 6,000 pounds of all Trump's flour a week. Is there a certain level where doing it that, the way that you guys have been talking about it just doesn't make sense on a production level? Or are there ways to uh, groom your Viga and pool making to withstand those high levels of production? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends. I don't. Under, it depends on. It's a case by case point. Um, so I, what I, I want to have my my dough because um, I don't use cold fermentation. So I, uh, I use the pre ferment. That's why you generally use pre ferment is to um, get all this flavor achieved so that your final dough is, uh, you know, because you're you're dealing with times. So you know, I, in my production times, I, I want to achieve coming in at a certain time and then being able to produce a product and serve at a certain time. So that's all, that all depends on your production. So it's, I don't know, John, you got it? I don't use a pre-ferment. I use extended, I use extended fermentation time, three to five days. So I feel like I, uh, I'm making dough in six locations. So, so I, so you're, you are not keeping a beer or coolish on I'm not. Or Okay. You know, for, for bread baking, for some bread breads that I do in my bakery, of course, we're using a, a pre-ferment or, or a sour. But for my pizza dough, I just do extended fermentation time. Okay. So, That's how I'm right. developing. So my, it, feeling, is, my feeling is that the whole, the whole, if my dough is five days old, basically the whole dough is a, is a pre-ferment. Right. So there's no point in him doing a pre-ferment because I, I don't have refrigeration space to, and I don't really want to go that route. That's a personal thing. Um, but with him, he's got tons of refrigeration. I saw his facility uh, the last couple of days. And if you're going to be mixing your dough and then balling it and then putting it away for 72 plus hours, there's no point in doing a, a pre-ferment. That's just a waste of time. Right. You could also use old dough. Right. You could add a percentage of old dough. Believe it or not, guys, minutes. you nailed it. Thank, thank you. For What's that? Answering. You actually answered my question. Okay, great. Right. Yeah, and I want to clarify that because I, I didn't want to, I hope that didn't get out there that, that everyone needs to use pre-ferments. This is a method and a technique. Uh, for, for a few years, there are a number of pizzerias that do pre-ferment plus extended cold fermentation. And I always, and I, before I started really thinking it through, I used to think, well, that's cool. You're kind of getting a double whammy there. And it might work, and it does work. Uh, Nancy Silverton certainly does that. She uses a sponge plus overnight. But, <laughs> yeah, or it could be but, too much. Yeah, but once you, but once you uh, start to extend the fermentation time through cold refrigeration or retarding the dough, which most pizzerias do, right? You make your dough, you form your dough balls, hold them overnight in the fridge, then you're getting a lot of the 
uh, of the enzyme and bacterial activity and yeast activity that the pre-ferment is designed to give you for a same day bake. So I think it is kind of redundant, what, what Brian's saying, it's redundant to, to do both. You really may not need to unless, and here's the caveat, unless you have a method that does use that technique and it works. You don't have to abandon it just because we said that you don't need it. If it's working for you, then, then, then go ahead. But if you want to start to tinker with it and, and, and do a, a side-by-side -side test, see if it really makes a noticeable difference by doing the double method. Uh, or if you can just abandon that and move on to just, you know, not no pre-ferment. And what, you may decide to stay with the double method. When, uh, when you guys were talking about exacerbated topics earlier in this discussion, it's, it's almost been a feeling in this expo that if you're not using a pre-ferment, you're doing it wrong. So it's really refreshing to hear that from you yes. guys. Thank yes. you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. We got uh, a couple more. First of all, so thank a couple you, but, people sat down. Maybe they we answered your questions by with someone else. It's good. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, for your contributions over the last couple of days. I've learned a lot from all three of you. Uh, my question has to do with John. You mentioned you're using a malted flour, and Brian, um, I believe the flours you mentioned are unmalted. What do you think the temperature threshold is for malted versus unmalted flour in the oven? I find that we it starts to be a little hard to control if you're going over 625 to 650. You know, it depends on the, on the amount of malt. He's asking if the pizza... Which, are you saying with malt, it's hard to control? If you use, yeah, if you're using a malt, a flour that has malted barley in it, or if you're adding malt yeah. yours, yourself, I think if you get over 650, you're starting to push so it a little bit. can you explain, uh, unless you want me to, if you could explain what the purpose of adding malted barley flour to flour is. What is what's its, what, why is it in there? What's its function? Uh, it's food for the yeast. Food for the yeast, right? It's and uh, and also uh, naturally it changes the flavor profile, but it also uh, aids browning. But sometimes it's also included in the flour to correct for the falling number. Falling number is the enzymatic activity, and also there's starch damage. Uh, starch damage actually really uh, speeds up. That's got a low. Uh, that's be a, that would be a low uh, falling number, but. Um, you can have wheat that just doesn't have, because you're relying upon enzymes. And the enzyme that converts the complex proteins and starches into simple sugars is the amylase enzyme. And that's what, yeast can't eat complex proteins and starches, but they can eat simple sugars. So you need that amylase enzyme. And if you have low en amylase enzyme activity, sometimes, the, like General Mills will put, that in there so that you have uh, yeast has something to eat. So am I, am I right though, Brian? Those central milling flours you mentioned are, are unmalted. They have them both ways. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and again, it's 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 uh, particular to your situation. Most commercial flour you buy uh, bread flour or all-purpose flour on the, on the supermarket shelves. It most you'll see in the bottom there. It'll say malted barley flour. That's put in there, and it's a very small amount, but it's really the enzymes. It's not about the sugar part of the malt, because it's maltose sugar, but it's because it's loaded with these amylase enzymes, or diastase enzymes, uh, that help to break apart the starch molecules of the flour to release the natural sugars in the flour. So if you have too much enzyme activity, you, you get early browning, you get a lot of browning on your crust. If you're not getting enough browning in your dough and you want more of a golden brown, then you can either get it, switch over to a uh, a malted you know flour that has that, or you can even buy some separate from the mills and spike the dough with a little bit if you need it. But it can be overdone, and and uh, I think again it's very much depends on the type of pizza and, and oven temperature you're you're baking at. Flours that don't have that barley malt and have low enzymatic activity, you know, the, the M M MLA's enzymes will do their job in time, even though it's it's at a lower rate. It's just going to take more time, because that's what you know it's all about is time and temperature. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, uh, I have a culinary background, but my uh, uh, knowledge base on like bread making and dough is still fairly limited at this point. I just wonder if you had any uh, good recommendations for books or any source materials that really resonate with you guys as both bread makers and pizza makers uh, that you'd recommend for somebody like myself. For beginners, I always recommend buying a very simple book that 
doesn't have any pictures or formulas, but all it does is talk about what's happening when you mix water and flour together. And it's called The Bread Builders by Daniel Wing and Alan Scott. It comes with a bonus, because the first half of the book is Daniel just talking about water, flour, and yeast. That's it. The bonus is on the other half of the book, it talks, uh, Alan Scott teaches you how to build your own wood fired oven in your backyard. It's a really cool book. Um, that's where I would start. And beyond that, you want to, once you get serious, uh, Mikel Suas has uh, advanced, uh, I think it's called Advanced Bread. That book is, is. Advanced Bread and Pastry, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's an amazing book. This is not a shameless plug. It's just. Just my honest opinion. I spy my fit, my go-to book right there on the floor. If somebody could hold it up, just happens to be there. I like, I like that book. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. Oh, yeah. That's uh, that's my go-to. Peter Peter tried, wasn't going to say that, so it's all right. I decided Thank you for doing that, that but uh, yeah, we tried to consolidate a lot of information, you know, all this, and and make it uh, understandable for both home bakers and professionals. Uh, I don't know if there's any copies left. We, we had a couple of copies. I do have uh, this other book, American Pie, which is more about my journey and uh, with a few recipes, but it does get into the science uh, left at the, at the guild, the Bread Baker's Guild table. But um, there's quite a number. Bread by Jeffrey Hamelman is another one I would add. It's called Bread, I think a baker's journal or something like that. But Jeffrey Hamelman, uh, very strong on the science side of bread making. And the guild, the newsletters from the guild are kind of like a... Like a uh, uh, and if, if you join the guild, I think they give you access to all the past issues, and it could be it could give you months and months of fruitful reading and and uh, both technical science and formulas. Is that okay? Sure. I had a question regarding oil. Uh, what is your approach towards it, and is there like a point of diminution returns for the amount you use in the dough? I, I didn't quite, understand. I question. couldn't quite understand. Could you get a look? It was about oil. So, is there what is your approach towards using oil? And is there is there a point of diminishing returns for the amount of oil used in the dough? Oil in dough. Yeah. Do you use oil in your dough? I don't use oil. I use oil in my dough, and the percentage depends on what I'm trying to achieve. So, I I feel that the oil, you know, and also you have to be very careful about when you introduce the oil into the into the mix. I'm not an advocate of throwing all your throwing your water in the in the in the bowl, pouring some oil in there, throwing your yeast in, and throwing the flour in. Oil and water don't mix. I think that it, I think that the oil will coat the uh, the grain and interfere and inhibit absorption. So I add oil after the dough has started to come together, very slowly, so that the the water has a chance to do what it's supposed to do. For New York style pizza, I I like to use oil. I use about two percent. But for um, Chicago-style pizza, for cracker crust pizza, you might go as high as 10%. You know, it, it goes back to what we said at the beginning of the, of the session. Decide what you want your pizza to be and then build towards that, knowing with, with your knowledge of how your, how your finished product is going to react to what you've done to it, what the variables are. Sure. So just, just to be clear, so you fully hydrate your dough and then add the oil afterwards? I do. I, if my mix, for example, was, say, 11 minutes, at about the four-minute mark, I might start to, dr to slowly slow drizzle oil in. It's a slow incorporation into the dough. Pardon me? It's a, slower, it's a slow incorporation into the dough. Right. Okay. One of the... Yeah. You want to add something to that, Brian? No. I was just going to say, you, you, when you're mixing, it depends on what kind of mixer, the, time, you know, the timing of, of adding oil depends on what kind of mixer you're using. So uh, a, a planetary versus a spiral, they all have their efficiency rate of bringing it together. But what John was saying, and it's very important, is when finally it all incorporates, right, you no longer see dry flour. If you, everything is starting to come together and, what, you know, some people call it shag. Um, that's when you want to start adding the, the and at slowly because you don't want to just dump it all in there. You slowly add it so it it it, it gets incorporated well. Because um, if you just toss it all in there at the same time, then all of a sudden your dough balls it's going to be the shag is just going to be thrown around. It's going to uh, take a lot longer to uh, incorporate in, and it's also that extra time could generate heat, which will get your final dough maybe warmer than you you want 
right? And what this leads us back to is when we talked earlier about formulas and re or whether you call it a formula or a recipe, the real, the real crucial thing is methodology because you can have a formula and change the method and you get a completely different result. Yeah. And again, different types of pieces. Uh, <clears throat> I just, there's a, in terms of shameless plug, so I don't, the book's not out yet, but I brought some cards, just announcement cards. So I worked, just worked on a book for pan pizzas, a book called Perfect Pan Pizza. It'll be out of May. Uh, if you want one of these cards, you can grab it before we finish. But, the, but in developing a dough for that book, I wanted to create a dough <laughs> that could be used for wow. a Sicilian, Good um, yeah. uh, uh, Detroit-style, focaccia, Roman-style, something they could work for a number of different, uh, because most people might have a different dough for each, but I wanted to have a universal dough that could make all of those styles, like John does at his place. And I came up with, uh, in my, my uh, development, 5% oil to flour by weight as an ideal but, but some people might want to use less or want to use more. So some versions have no oil at all. And that's based on using American bread flour that you could buy at a supermarket, you know, whether it's General Mills or, uh, or King Arthur, any of the brands. So 5% is is, is, was turned out to be legit for me on that. And uh, other times I would use less. But once again, depends on the type of pizza that you're making, I think. And, and yeah, you can, no. you, I, the, I, the, just one more thing, the functionality of why you add the oil later after you give the dough a head start in mixing is that oil can interfere with gluten development. Fat is a type of shortening, it shortens gluten. So if you give the gluten a head start to develop, if you give it the gliadin and the gluten and a chance to bond before you add the oil, it promotes the gluten development a little bit better and then the oil coats the outside of it and allows it to stretch rather than getting in the middle of it and, and causing it to weaken. So, Thank you. Touching on that subject, um, I'm from originally from Chicago and now I live in California, so God help me when it comes to pizza. But um, as far as there's a place in Chicago called Lou Malnati's. It's like the number one pan pizza place. What's it called? Lou Malnati's. Oh, Lou Malnati's. Okay, yeah. It's a real crumbly, crispy. A, yeah, that's a different kind of pizza. That's a, yeah. the Chicago deep dish, yeah. Yes. I've been trying to duplicate that or get as close as possible for 25 years. Shortening. Any ideas? Shortening, yeah. yeah. Shortening, Shortening and don't mix it much. It's more of a pastry dough than a pizza dough in that sense. Think and biscuit. Yes, yeah, so it's like a biscuit right. dough. So it's so it's much higher in fat. Right, right. it might be 10% fat and, then, and you might be using either lard or uh, vegetable shortening instead of instead of an olive oil or so, corn oil yeah and it's a and it's a as I, as Brian said it's a short mix yeah so I, I tried I tried that you know I'm adding my my fats to the flour and and breaking it up and coating every molecule yeah, of like that a biscuit, flour yeah. and then I'm incorporating my water is that is that kind of the right path yeah yeah, you would you're, do that? you're purposely, in this case, you're using the shortening capabilities of the fat to purposely shorten the gluten so it becomes more tender and biscuit-like. Right. So it's the opposite, opposite of, of developing a strong dough for pizza. It's more of a pastry-style dough. And, then, and that's why, you know, why it bakes in a different way, and, but it's also you know, much heavier in toppings. So it's a completely different kind of pizza. It's wonderful in its own right. It's just that the rules that we've been talking about for the pizza doughs, the, the, the other kind of pizza doughs sure. uh, are different. And there's a lot of resources on the web available for Yeah. Them. What percentage of oil are you using or shortening? About 10%. Yeah, that's that's yeah. in the ballpark. Yeah. That's that's about right. Are you familiar with pizzamaking.com? I am. Have you I've searched? all of them and none of them no? for me. So I'm doing something wrong. Well, there's... there's an old book. There's a book that's been out for a long time, a, a dedicated totally to Chicago deep dish pizza, and I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head. But it has some some uh, formulas and recipes in there for the difference between Gino's and Malnati's and Due and you know they all have their own slight variations. But the, right, like Pequod's is nowhere near what uh, Lou Malnati's is, and that's even Lou Malnati's is different from Gino's East. Yeah. They're all slightly different. Yeah, and some Thank have a lot of cornmeal in them. Some don't. Uh, right. They're all pretty good, you know. But again, everyone got their. What, using fla their, what flour their are you using? Okay, so if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to go hardcore, you use the Sarasota that 
they use in Chicago. And you might want to try adding some cornmeal. And so, you know, drive in that 10% cornmeal. cornmeal yeah. And corn oil is also right, very popular. Oil, yeah. Instead of using shortening. Yeah, you, could, you, you don't have to use shortening. We're trying to, you know, the, the, the whole idea of hydrogenated shortening is becoming uh, phased out because of the health issues. So you may want to just use oil, which has a slightly different property. And corn oil gives it, has a different flavor and uh, a lot sort of like Pequod's, I believe, uses. And yeah, yeah, so I definitely yeah, use I definitely good. use the yeah, corn oil. But, you <laughs> know, he swears in his interviews he never uses cornmeal. Who? Who? Yeah. No, no. no that's, this is different no. from Geno's and all. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the, it's all personal. Again, just like with all the other pizza doughs. But it's going to, I think... Uh, the fat is the key, and okay. finding the right ratio for you is the bottom Thank line. Thank you. Yeah. I have, a, I have another question regarding um, that. Uh, kind of like the, or the gentleman earlier was asking something along the lines of, you know, is there a point of no return um, with the percentage of oil in the dough? You know, implying, you know, kind of how much can you put in there? Um, I have some friends that you know go up to like. Eight percent oil, um, on the basis that it allows for um, longer periods of, uh, like it'll last in the the balls will last in the fridge a lot longer, and also um, they say that it adds to the crispiness of the pie later. Can you guys um, confirm or deny these? Things? Oil actually does the opposite. Oil softens. It well it tenderizes dough, but but it could depending on the bottom heat. Also, kind of cause a little bit of a, a crispness or a snap on the very bottom yeah, part of the crust. I, I use oil to tenderize the dough, basically. I mean, yeah, it's mostly you know. for tenderization because uh, again, it 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 uh, counteracts some of the toughness of the gluten. Right. Right. So the higher you go, the the softer the 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 dough is going to be. So like brioche is like fifty percent fat, right? Brioche can be anywhere from twenty five to. 100% right. fat right. the flour, right. and so typically 50% would be But now be we're talking about almost an enriched dough right. in, in, yeah. in this case. Yeah. But uh, you know, typically the Chicago-style pizza doughs are also low, very low in hydration relative to what we do. Yeah. It might be 52% water and a 10%... 10% any, uh, any, like, preservation techniques or preservation issues that it, that it brings uh, putting more oil in the dough? Well, it, 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 it's a, it is a preservative, right? It's going to give it shelf life. It holds moisture in too. It's uh, hydroscopic, so it helps to keep things tender, like hold, retaining moisture. Again, uh, I think when well, you see some some used in doughs, uh, like if uh, to get that nice crisp bottom on a Detroit style pizza, it's it's not because of the oil that's in the dough, but it's because of the oil that's under the dough that kind of fries the bottom of it. Right. But but it has you know it kind of the stuff that's in the dough also kind of adds to that. But, it, but again, if you think about fat as its primary function in dough as a tenderizer, then it gives you some parameters to work with. You're welcome. Last question. So this is a question probably for Brian, but do you, do you, auto, do you guys auto-lease a dough or do you find it to be unnecessary? Thank you. Do you all know what auto-lease means? <clears throat> See, a couple of years ago, nobody would know that. Now you all know. It's amazing. The uh, auto-lease... <laughs> You can use auto lease for several reasons. And, and you know, and a lot of people, it was uh, Calvell who developed the technique. And his original uh, reason for that was for uh, basically getting getting the protease enzymes jump started. And because if you're going to, protease enzymes break down um, complex protein bonds. So if you're doing a low hydrated dough that you want to have extensibility, because low hydrated doughs are generally elastic. So the autolyse that Calvell created was for getting the protease enzymes jump started with a minimum of 45 minute mix of just the water and the flour so that the protease was already used to, you know, jump started because you have to, uh, water activates um, these enzyme packages. And now you have people who are utilizing autolyse for another reason, and that is for generally high hydrated doughs. You mix the water and flour together and you just let it sit. Some let it sit overnight, um, and some sit, let it sit for an hour. 
And then when you finally start mixing, all that time of uh, the absorption of everything absor has already absorbed and been sitting, when you start mixing it, it, it comes together a lot faster. So it depends. Everybody's got a different methodology. Chad Robertson does it for, for his high, because it's high hydrated. So there's a different method for Autolise depending so on. Do you, do you yourself use Autolise method in your pizzeria? Not in my pizzeria, no. I, but the Pouliche already, you know, I'm 25% pre-fermented, so I already have, I'm already introducing kind of that activity. Through the pre-ferment? Yeah. Yeah, because of the Pouliche, yeah. So you'll see that a lot of this t technique done a lot in bread bakeries to give that bread, especially when they're trying to produce a bread on the same day. So it, 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 it does what Brian said it really well. It, it, it jump starts uh, some kind of enzyme activity that helps with with the extensibility of your dough. Uh, and But it's not necessarily necessary for an overnight pizza dough if you're balling it up and holding it overnight. Right. I, I have a friend who likes to pre-ferment 50% of his flour because he wants to get in, mix it, maybe do a stretch and fold, shape it, get it into um, its shape, and let's start proving immediately. He just wants to get all that stuff done in a shorter time frame. So the how much pre-ferment you use can be a methodology for your production schedule. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, listen, that's uh, just about that time. Looks like I've been cut off. Uh, my mic's on. Can you hear me?